Hi, this is Carol Pope. Hi, I'm Kevin Staples. And, and you're, you're listening, listening to Rainbow, Rainbow Country, Country with Mark Tara. The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the persons appearing on the program. Today on Rainbow Country, LGBT streaming platform, Strong Voices TV, SVTV, celebrating the LGBTQ community in television, in film, sports, advocacy, and beyond. That and more in episode 394, so stay tuned. The Gay Talk Radio right here on Rainbow Country. Hello, my name is Conchita. And I'm Barbecue. And my name is Hardcora. And we are the The Beat Girls. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Well, hello and welcome to a brand new journey through Rainbow Country. As I like to call it... A little gay radio show working to give voice to the LGBT community and beyond. And as always, I am your tour guide through Rainbow Country. I'm producer and host, Mark Tara. By the way, Rainbow Country originates from CIUT-FM in Toronto, and now proudly in syndication on 12 outlets across Canada, from coast to coast to coast. The Yukon, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, the east coast of Canada in Newfoundland, Ontario, even down to Buffalo, New York, and online. Well, thanks to you tuning in, streaming, downloading, but ultimately listening. Together we continue to build Rainbow Country into a nationally syndicated gay radio show, a number one LGBT podcast on Podomatic.com's Gay and Lesbian Chart, as well as being recognized as Canada's number one LGBT podcast on Feedspot.com. So today, my 2021 interview for LGBT streaming platform, Strong Voices TV Network, a subscription-based streaming platform for the LGBTQ community, its allies and advocates. Founder and CEO Cherie Johnson joins me to talk all things SVTV, and more. Plus an hour two, music from LGBT artists, independent artists, voices that we've come to know and love in classic disco, classic 80s, classic house. And on this episode, I'm featuring some rock remix, some queer country, and more. All that lies ahead as we start Journey 394 through Rainbow Country. And our first stop, the Rainbow Country Bookstore. Today... Begin Transmission, the trans allegories of the Matrix, tracking one person's transition journey from Thomas Anderson to Neo to Trinity. Writer of comics, screenplays, and teleplays, award-winning creator Tilly Bridges reads from her latest book, Begin Transmission, the trans allegories of the Matrix. The Matrix is a confirmed and intentional trans allegory written and directed by two transgender sisters, Lily and Lana Wachowski. They weren't out as trans when the first three movies or the Animatrix were made, but publicly came out as trans before the fourth movie. This changes the context for some of the films, which we'll discuss along the way. I want to remind you that these movies are fantastic humans versus machines sci fi movies and that the first absolutely revolutionized action movies and special effects, and there's also entire religious and philosophical metaphors to explore. All of those things are well worth discussing. The movies are so dense and have so many layers, I'm in awe as a writer. But I'm only going to talk about the trans allegories. Please don't take that as an indication I don't think those other things exist or aren't worth discussing. It's just that these allegories are so densely packed with detail about the trans experience that it's going to take this entire book to explain them. Note that the very name, Matrix, means a set of rules and procedures that define how something works. 
The society we all live in is our matrix. And yes, it does have you. Well, many of you. It's the cisgender binary we're all forced into at birth without our consent. It restricts us and harms us in all sorts of ways, which these movies will show you time and again. Neo's our lead, and The Matrix is about his journey in coming to terms with the fact that he's transgender. Reloaded is about all the ways society comes for you once you're out as trans, and wondering if we would have transitioned if we knew how hard life would become. Revolutions is about dealing with our own internalized transphobia and where we might be able to go in the future, or where we hope society might go. Resurrections is about detransitioning and retransitioning, and the co-opting and erasure of trans voices. But we have to go in order for everything to make sense. Neo always presents as male in the movies, of course, but remember this is allegory, and the first movie was also made in 1999. Here we are over 20 years later, and we still don't have a transgender sci-fi action movie lead. We can't hold that against them. The surface level story is about Neo accepting that he's the one, and there will be much more on that later, but his journey is a trans one. His chosen name, Neo, literally means new. His dead name is Thomas Anderson. Thomas means twin, and Anderson means son of Andrew, and Andrew means manly or masculine. This means his name roughly translates to twin of the manly or masculine. This is your very first indicator of just how intentional these allegories are. You don't accidentally pick a name that means twin of the masculine for a trans allegory. And even if you somehow did, if that was the only evidence, then sure, maybe it's a coincidence. But it's only the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Morpheus, in mythology, is the god of dreams. In The Matrix, Morpheus is Neo's superego and subconscious, and knows of his dream to be his true self. He knows the truth about Neo and spends every movie trying to help him accept it. Cypher is Neo's id and his doubt. A cipher is literally a secret, a code that hides the truth. It plagues Neo, eating at him. His id is so sure that he's in fact not trans and would be all too happy to just never think about it again. Neo's doubt is later personified by Link and then Bugs, but those are very different kinds of doubt that we'll discuss when those characters appear. Trinity is Neo's self-actualization, the person he wishes to be. Her name alone tells you she's Neo, one, the ego, Morpheus, two, the superego, and Cypher, three, the id, all rolled into one. Trinity's in balance, in harmony, a whole person. Also note, she is a woman. The other three are men. Neo has to reconcile these supposedly male aspects of himself if he ever wants to attain self-actualization. Note how similar Neo and Trinity look, even down to their hair. None of that's by accident. Everything in a movie is a choice. And not only does this also hold through all four movies, I submit to you it is the entire point of all four movies. They tell the journey of one person, from Thomas Anderson to Trinity. Agent Smith begins as the personification of society and the passive transphobia it exhibits by designing a system, the cisgender binary, that does not even account for the existence of transgender people. Over the course of the first movie and then through the sequels, he comes to represent active transphobia, the parts of society society that acknowledge trans existence only so they can then attack it and try to make it impossible for us to exist within it. Other important things to know before we start. The Oracle is Neo's heart, later replaced by Bugs. Tank is the trans community, later replaced by Zion and then Io. Locke is Neo's fear. Niobe is Neo's confidence. And the color red is vital to understanding all four movies, wherein it stands for unequivocal truth. Know that it stands for truth now, and the explanation for why that is will come early in discussing the first movie. Blue stands for doubt, and yellow for fear. Always. The mixture of these colors is also used to convey more complex things. Purple shows you there's truth and doubt. Orange shows you there's truth and fear. The green overcast of the original trilogy shows you The world the cisgender binary matrix has created is based in fear and doubt. Yellow plus blue equals green. All agents 
police, and security guards across all movies are cis white men. This is also intentional. It's showing you who benefits from the false cisgender binary, who set it up, and who extracts power from it to keep themselves at the top. This is also why the architect and the analyst are cis white men. These are the bedrock of the allegories. The foundation of everything else is built on and used to say all that the Wachowskis have to say. The good news is these are explained to you through the movies themselves. We're going to go through them all in order, not exactly frame by frame, but it might as well be for as much as these movies have to say. To truly understand the allegories, you'll need to go in order and read them in the order written, in the order of the movie's release. Jumping ahead will only lead to confusion, so I don't recommend it. But technically, you can if you want to. I mean, I'm not the boss of you. I can only show you the door. You're the one that has to walk through it. When I return, LGBT streaming platform, Strong Voices TV. Hi, everybody. This is Gino Vanelli. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Cherie Johnson, hi, how are you? Great, Mark. How about yourself? I am well. I am better now that I am speaking with you to have <laughs> to have your voice, to have your story be heard by the by the LGBT community and beyond, especially to talk about strong voices television. Definitely. I'm ready. SVTV Network. Let's start there. Talk to me about Strong Voices Television and what this is all about. Um, Strong Voices Television, the SBTV network, uh, was born, uh, you know, it just, it just came to fruition. Um, started back in 2012, uh, I started the top lesbian web series, Studville TV. Uh, during that time frame, um, in my apartment, I had a chalkboard, uh, wall, uh, painted at the time. And I would put, uh, series and scenarios and scenes for the show on the chalkboard. I would just splash them up. Well, in the middle of that chalkboard, uh, God gave me a vision. Uh, at the time, it was named Gay Flicks. I'm so glad I changed it because uh, that sounds kind of pornographic. Uh, but at that time, I just know that our community needed our own platform. Netflix at the time was taken off. Uh, and you know, I needed, I knew that the LGBTQ community, uh, needed, uh, a platform of their own. Well, uh, fast forward a couple of years, uh, 2017 SVTV network was born. Um, and we've grown tremendously. Uh, the reason behind that is our top lesbian web series on YouTube, um, was demonetized and, uh, because of the algorithm, rhythm, uh, they stated uh, that they could not find suitable ad partners any longer for us. Uh, we can always find ad partners during Pride Month, uh, but <laughs> there was difficulties at the time. Uh, along with other uh, top LGBTQ content creators during that time, and uh, it left me scrambling to find some more life uh, to the series. Uh, we did have a season four. Uh, but it was strictly on our uh, the SVTV network platform. And along with other content creators uh, who tell stories of the LGBTQ community, uh, our mission is to amplify the voices of the LGBTQ community uh, and give a safe platform that we can tell our lives, our stories, our way on one network, not be demonetized or, you know, you know, talked about or, or demeaned or, or, or any of those things. Uh, so just a safe platform uh, for our community. So that's how the network was born. And, and that's where we are now. Are you religious? Yes, I am. Okay. 
and talk to me about your uh, your religion and your sexuality and how you see those two coming together as opposed to being driven apart um i've never you know i was raised in, in a baptist church uh, grandparents took me to church uh i'm a christian uh, and, uh, I just know for the religion that I practice and, and there are plenty, you know, um, I've just always been me before I came out as lesbian <laughs> in, in my, my late teens, uh, going into my twenties, uh, you know, I, I had feelings, but I, I was never deterred by family or deterred, <laughs> deterred, <laughs> deterred by family or, or anyone, a uh, couple of scenarios in, in the church, actually. I, I, I went to a pastor one time when my grandmother uh, was getting older, uh, getting dementia uh, in her late 80s. And, uh, you know, I went to my pastor crying before church about that situation. And, uh, you know, he said he'll talk to me later about it. And and my family stayed right across the street from the church. My, my grandparents did. And uh, that was my church home at the time. And so he said he would talk to me later. And then church came about and, you know, it started off just fine. But when it was time for the sermon, ironically, it was a sermon about, you know, how being LGBTQ was wrong. In my view, in, in my interpretation of the Bible, uh, I, I serve a, a forgiving God. And I believe that God knew uh, that's in the Bible as well. He knew me. Before my parents knew me, before I was a sparkle in their eye, uh, he knew what the outcome of my life and the purpose of my life was going to be. And so I, I just try and live up right uh, within my sexuality. Um, and, you know, and I just live my life just like any other person, just myself. Um, I, I don't go into church raising rainbow flags or, or anything, uh, you know, I'm, I'm I present myself as a, a masculine of center, uh, uh, lesbian um, in my dress. Um, you know, I, I go to heterosexual events with a tuxedo on, or I may have the tuxedo on and, and, and feel that, you know, maybe the bow tie may be too much. So I'll take the bow tie off and just mm-hmm. unbutton the first collar. Hey, uh, the hey, first hey. Button. <laughs> uh, but uh, hey, uh, <laughs> I don't go past the first button. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, uh, I, I am very religious and I, I believe that, you know, God gave me this vision. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's given me the tools to bring that vision to fruition. Uh, he's molded me. He's, he's been by my side when others have, have gone a different way. Um, you know, I've learned lessons. I've, I've learned to be humble and forgiving and, you know, all of those things that are taught. And, and, you know, I just know that, that I believe, uh, that God sent his son to die for my sins. So if it's considered a sin, but the God I serve, you know, preaches love, acceptance, and it says, love your neighbor. It does not say love thy neighbor unless if, they're gay. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and, and only if they're not, if they're gay, yeah. uh, don't love them. Yeah, that's, and, that's not written. So, and a higher, I, and a ahead. higher power gave you a vision. Uh, SVTV, great animated shorts. You've got animated shorts. You have comedy. You have documentaries. You've got original series. Talk to me about these these various types of programming that you have on Strong Voices Television. And how do you find these these programs? How do you how do you find these these shows? All right. So we consider ourselves, in, in my opinion, in, in my team's opinion, uh, we consider ourselves the gay Hulu, mm. because if you know from their advertising, Hulu has sports. Uh, so we partnered with uh, a lot of uh, uh, top sporting leagues. We partner with uh, production uh, companies. We've partnered with distributors, um, content providers. Uh, we've partnered with, <laughs> you know, uh, film festivals. Um, so it, it is various ways that that we uh, come across uh, award winning and, and valuable content that tells our lives, our stories, our way. Um, 
so again, partnerships, networking, um, just getting the word out about us. And we have people approaching us. Uh, so if they meet our, our platform standards, um, uh, then, you know, that they're on the network. So we license, we have licensing deals that we do uh, for the content and uh, with our content providers. So we, we, various places we come up with the content. So. So you've got Roku, you have Apple TV, you've got Amazon Fire TV, you've got Android. These are all uh, platforms that has uh, SVTV to watch. Talk to me about these platforms and are you expanding these as time goes on? Well, you know, you this isn't a unique platform. It's, un it's a unique niche. Uh, you know, we have something for everyone under the rainbow. So it's not, you know, a specific color or creed is is rainbow and and you know whatever you identify within the LGBTQ plus uh, community. Um, but how we are we decide on on what platforms we distribute our content, our platform on the apps uh, is how. Any other platform does it. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I I own an iPhone, so you know, of course, we need to. All my friends own mm -hmm. iPhones. I have an so Android. Course, I'm I'm Android. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, but we have you know iOS app. So mm -hmm. we have the Apple app, mm -hmm. um, and that comes along with Apple TV. So mm -hmm. you know, we're on Apple TV as well. So that takes care of the iOS family, and then we have people like yourself, Mark. Android. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Come on, Mark. But okay. Okay. We're not judging. Uh, uh, so Android family, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I have one or two teammates, former teammates uh, from my college days who have Androids. Okay. And, and ironically, <laughs> she is the only one in her family. Her husband, her three boys, they all have iPhones and she's the only one in the house with an Android. Uh, but maybe that's a mother's sacrifice. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, so we have Android. But like any streaming platform, these are the top apps that they go for. Uh, so it, it, it was a no-brainer on that. Uh, they have the largest reach. Uh, and so our platform, uh, the SVTV network, goes along with that reach. We're reaching over 55 million homes through our apps. So, you know, and Roku, Roku, you know, I watch SVTV network on, on Roku, uh, you know, uh, uh, the smart TVs. I was um, just going to ask, it, yes. in 2022, mm -hmm. uh, someone buys a new smart TV. It comes with, you know, Roku on it or, or what have you. Does it also come with SVTV if they yeah. have these? these? Yes. All you do is just go to the search bar, type in SVTV network, download mm -hmm. it to your smart television. And then you have SVTV Network on your television. So right I have a smart down. television and I watch SVTV Network all the time on television, on the big screen. So mm. <laughs> uh, our story is on the big screen. There. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yes, we do have plans to uh, grow our apps. Uh, we're looking to get on gaming consoles. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Xbox 360 mm -hmm. and PS5. Mm -hmm. Are we on five now or six? Yeah, PS5. <laughs> And uh, so, yes, we are we are looking to expand uh, within the next uh, few quarters. And on that note, we'll return after this Rainbow Country update. Hi everyone, this is Mark Tewksbury, Olympic champion, leader, humanitarian. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Hitmakers is a full-service, award-winning record label and social enterprise based in Iqaluit, Nunavut. We specialize in the creating and marketing of world-class Inuit and indigenous music, including pop, hip-hop, rock, folk, and traditional Inuit music. Hitmakers has studios in Iqaluit, Ottawa, and Toronto. 
The label currently works with more than 20 Inuit and Indigenous artists, and we represent and promote many more. The company was founded in 2016, and our mission is to create viable careers in the arts for Inuit and Indigenous artists through music, media, and education. Our secondary mission is to empower artists to share and strengthen their stories and culture. To learn more, please connect with us on social media or at hitmakers.com. That's hitmakers with a Z. Thanks for listening. Koyanami. Hi, my name is Joanne Vanicola, and I'm an actor and a writer. And I was first on Rainbow Country with Mark Tara on discussing the massacre at Pulse Club in, in Orlando. Um, I realized how important it was for our community to have a radio station uh, specifically for our issues to, to talk about people in, in the LGBTQ community and to provide a, an outlet for our stories, um, to discuss uh, our politics, culture, and give voice to the, to the issues that matter to us. And of course our artists and, and um, the things that we do globally and and to talk about culture and without people like Mark Tara uh, providing a space for this with, with a radio show like this then uh, we wouldn't have that voice so support tune in thank you hi I'm Joey Lamar best selling author of Mambo Lips and Salsa Hips and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara Cherie Johnson, you are, you have Strong Voices Television. You are also an author. You have a new children's book. Black, yes. Black, Black Girl Magic. Yes. What is I'm also an educator and volleyball and basketball coach. I do a mm-hmm. lot. And I, mm-hmm. I sometimes I sit and reflect and like, wow, thank you, Lord, because I don't know how. how. What's this book uh, all about? The book, Black Girl Magic. So during uh, the COVID times, uh, I saw a, a lot of African-American women on the forefront uh, with the George Floyd uh, situation, Breonna Taylor, and you know, black women were leading leading the way. Uh, but black women are also uh, some of the ones who are you know done done wrong the most, in my opinion, uh, being an African American woman. Um, but what I saw during that time frame was also African American children, black children. Uh, on the forefront with their parents, with their moms. Um, And this book, actually, I did a short film uh, uh, starring uh, Brilee Evans um, and uh, some other top-notch actors in the short film. Uh, But I wrote a book to uh, go parallel with the short film um, just to build up the young ladies, young African-American ladies, uh, building their confidence, you know, uh, uh, letting them know that the magic is within because they are going to face a lot of adversities in their life, not only because of their color, but because they're women. Uh, so, you know, I wanted to teach and reach uh, our youth um, and, and just let them know that they have the magic within. They have that black girl magic uh, within them. So the children's book was born. Mm. This is your third book. Did you yes. always want to be a writer? No. It just kind of comes with when I see something that resonates with me. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I feel the urge or the need to put it in some type of platform or medium, some mm-hmm. type of medium. Mm-hmm. And and the books have have coincided with that. Uh, years ago, I did author two books uh, dealing with uh, women in infertility, not just the LGBTQ mm-hmm. community, but women in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I was running a foundation called FreeIVF.com uh, to offset the cost of uh, in vitro fertilization. 
um, but the books were dealing with uh, ways to find uh, inexpensive ways to do IVF or uh, inexpensive ways to get medications for IVF mm -hmm. um, and, and just tidbits and advice, but the book's really outdated now. <laughs> uh, but those were the last the last books I wrote until yeah. Black Girl Magic came about. Yeah. You are an author, as we just talked about. You have now created a streaming service. You have several several degrees, a master's in social science, a bachelor's in communication, just to name two. You're part of the LGBT community. You're a proud lesbian. When did you start recognizing that aspect of yourself growing up, that you had these attractions to women? Mm, I would say about my junior or senior year in high school. Mm. Well, actually, when I look back, I, I think sixth grade, but, you know, I, they really didn't come to full bloom until uh, my senior year and then all full out in, in college, my freshman year in college. But I, I look back in the sixth grade uh, where, you know, I had a crush on a, a female and, you know, I, I, I coerced another female to to, you know, kind of rough her up in the bathroom and. I wanted to come in and save the day. Mm. Uh, so that that was sixth grade. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then, you know, uh, my junior year, senior year, there were others uh, like me, you know, uh, who were already out lesbians at my high school. And uh, yeah, so then by the time I got to college, yeah, it was it was full blown at that point. So. Did you play basketball at one point? Yes, I played uh, Division One basketball at the University of South Florida in mm -hmm. Tampa. My prayers are with them in Florida right now. I've, I've called and checked on my teammates with uh, Hurricane Ian uh, uh, swirling around. Uh, one of my teammates hadn't had power in like a whole day, so and they don't have a generator. And I'm like, how are you in Florida and don't have a generator? But, you know, it is what it is, but they're safe. Um, so played uh, basketball there. I played semi-pro basketball uh, for a team uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and how, long then, have, how long did you play for? Um, I tore my ACL. Uh, okay. So probably about two years semi-pro. Mm -hmm. And this was before there was a WNBA. And then it was when it was time for the WNBA, and that came about, uh, tryouts in Atlanta was like you stood in line for an hour to make a right hand layup, like what if you missed that layup? <laughs> I di I didn't want to go overseas uh, to to play ball. I just was very fearful of of things uh, that could happen overseas, and 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 you know what's going on with Brittany Griner. I resonate with that, but mine was more of you know people were careless or or just gung ho overseas willing to strap a bomb on their chest and just walk in the mall and just blow up innocent people. Yeah. And some of those things had happened. And I was like, ah, no, <laughs> no. So my journey uh, with basketball ended at that time. Do you miss it? I do miss it. I play occasionally. Now I coach. Mm -hmm. uh, I coach uh, volleyball and I coach basketball. Um, my volleyball team is eight times back-to-back -back champions. We're going for nine championships wow. in a row this year. That. Thank you. Uh, basketball team uh, got four championships, not consecutive, but four championships since I've been coaching uh, basketball. Um, so I, I, I live vicariously through the kids. And, and now I just use my knowledge of the game. And I still learn every day. I mean, I'm not a Michael Jordan of basketball. He was my favorite, though. But uh, uh, so, you know, what knowledge I do have, you know, I, I give that to the kids as well. But also I, I teach them about life and sportsmanship and, and those type of things as well. So this next question might sound odd, but do you think of yourself as a smart individual, a smart person, as opposed to being you're obviously educated, but do you think of yourself as a smart person? Because you've come up with something. You said you were given a vision. But you were also being given a vision and you materialized it. You actualized it. 
I don't think that's to answer your question. Yes, I think I'm smart, and I think everyone is smart. Uh, you know, uh, again with my faith, I believe God gives everyone's talents. Mm -hmm. uh, he gives everyone visions, and then He'll give you those tools to execute and bring those visions but and put the right to, people in your life. Yes, but you have to be able to recognize those tools and to be able to utilize it, yes. and to be able to be smart enough to put those pieces together and you've been able to do that so i think it's all all of execution mm. so i i don't think you have to be super smart to execute anything but you have to be you have to be able to communicate and you have to be able to network because there are high school dropouts who clearly are smarter than me because yes. they're millionaires billionaires yes. i mean so does that make them smart i mean they dropped out of high school it does make them smart Mm, but there's a different right. there, there's you're a right. different type of smart. But Street I think smarts. it's all execution. Ex yeah, true. I think it's execution. True. If you can put a plan together and execute that plan, then maybe it makes you look smart. But it's the execution of that plan. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I I think I'm smart. Yes. Uh, I I do have my weaknesses. I I can't say that I'm 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 street smart. Maybe there's some things I work on, and you know try and put people that are smarter than me around me. I don't know everything. So no one, I believe, knows in everything. So the, to a degree, everyone is smart, but people just are on different levels of the smartness. <laughs> and then execution makes you look smarter, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Strong Voices Television Network. How did this name come about? Um, again, <laughs> I'm, glad anything, I'm, I'm glad anything came about <laughs> after <laughs> I'm looking at the wall. I took pictures of that wall. I still have those pictures. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, gay flicks sitting in the middle. I'm glad <laughs> anything came about it at that point. Um, <laughs> but to answer your question, uh, it, it formulated from our community always having to fight. There's always having to be a voice. Pride started with a riot. People's voices. They stood up for the voiceless. Um, you know, we're always fighting for our rights. We're always fighting for equality. Now, the fight of the SBTV network is representation and equality in television, film, and sports. Uh, uh, and a place to, to of our own you know, for us and by us. Um, and so because, you know, we want to amplify those voices, Strong Voices Television was born. That was the name. Because our mission is to amplify the voices of the LGBTQ community in television, film, sports, and advocacy. But it all began and, and came to that title because we're always in a fight. Mm -hmm. Our community is always in a fight. And and sometimes with each other. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah, you hit the nail on the head yeah, right there. Yeah. So, uh, I believe it, it it was 2017 when you said YouTube changed their algorithm, mm -hmm. and your channel at the time was demonetized. Correct. Be because of that. What then? Correct. What then? And either inspired you or gave you the idea to then create something of your own to be able to create an app, create this what what is now, uh, you know, SVTV. Because it's one thing to have your 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 stuff on on YouTube. That's all fine and dandy. It gets demonetized. Okay, fine. But now you have to go and invent something, create something of your own to be able to showcase your show and other shows. What gave you that idea? What gave you the impetus, the inspiration to follow through with that? It, being kicked off their platform. Uh, mm -hmm. So <laughs> with that, I really got tired of seeing our community in television and film and sports, mm -hmm. beg for a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. So we built the table. Mm -hmm. A platform that is built by us, for us. 
it's just that simple. <laughs> because you could have easily have just, you know, okay, this is fine. The run on YouTube was great. But now that run, run has come to an end. End of story. But they said it came to an end. I didn't say it. We didn't say it came to an okay. end. Okay. So be- you, <laughs> right. you believed in yourself. You, you, then. you told us it was coming to an end. We mm. weren't done. Mm. <laughs> so that was at the end of season three. Okay. And so again, we did a whole season four and it was never on YouTube. It's always been launched. It launched as mm. one of the, the top shows uh, along with some other shows uh, when we launched in 2017 on the platform. So mm. it's never touched YouTube. Mm. And SVTV is still on on YouTube, is it not? We have a YouTube channel, yeah. And we just we just put uh, like trailers and so forth. But all of our content, we have our own platform. Again, it's consider us SVTV. like a, a net right. Mm-hmm. Consider us. So we have web. Mm-hmm. So we through our website, just like Netflix. You go to Netflix.com and you know Hulu.com. They have a website. You can join there. You can watch on the web our content once you subscribe. Or you can uh, use the apps uh, once mm. you subscribe. Mm-hmm. So, right. But That's yes, we do use the the YouTube channel mm-hmm. just now to push traffic to our uh, platform. To your platform, and on mm-hmm. on YouTube, your channel has what over four million views. Right, but a lot of that came because actually that was the uh, the series uh, mm. YouTube channel, mm-hmm. and again it was the top one on there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, we just the the network decided to take over that uh, YouTube page. So on SVTV, what are some of your top uh, shows in terms of like genres and all that sort of thing? Right, so. Uh, in series, we have, uh, of course, Studville TV. That's that's a series that was on YouTube. It's still one of the top watched uh, series on on our platform uh, now that is off YouTube. Um, Avocado Toast. That is another series uh, out of Canada. Great series. Uh, uh, two lesbian females uh, lead that. Uh, they were award nominated. I think they were for an Emmy at some point nomination. Uh, so that is a great series. Um, so those are the top in episodic, I guess you would say. Um, uh, Trade. Trade was a good film. It is now served its time on, <laughs> sounds like prison time, uh, is now uh, the licensing uh, time frame has, has expired. So it is no longer on our platform as of last week, uh, but it was the top watched. It uh as far as transgender stories, um, it was it was a great story, uh, a, a true story actually, um, about a uh, transgender uh, woman uh, who was a streetwalker, and uh, she got caught up in a relationship, um, and you know the wife found out of the husband, and you know people double homicides and you know all types of stuff but that was a great that was a great film uh we also have sports documentaries not only do we have a uh, live streaming sports which is now one of the top you elements have live on our streaming platform. sports now, yeah we just wow. added uh back in uh hmm. march we had a hmm. live streaming sports so we've uh partnered with the top lgbtq sporting leagues so naga we just did the naga world series in dallas texas we went down to dallas we did the Asana Softball World Series in uh, Maryland, D.C., Washington, D.C. We did the Legacy Bowl, which is like the gay uh, women's tackle football uh, league. Um, so they had the Legacy Bowls, like the Super Bowl. Uh, that was in Orlando. We did that. They also that that weekend had uh, their first skills challenge. So we live streamed the skills challenge and they had an all-star game. And so we live streamed the all-star game as well. Um, and, uh, we've done out of Atlanta, we're based in Atlanta. Uh, we did the big peach. Um, that's the largest Memorial, uh, weekend, uh, uh, softball tournament, uh, gay softball tournament tournament in Atlanta. Um, so we did that. Um, we, uh, have done some others. I, I can't think offhand right now, but we, we have introduced live streaming sports. You have that, our platform. That's amazing. 
we're the only uh, LGBTQ streaming platform yes. with live streaming sports. Yes. So yeah. Well that's done. our differentiator. Um, but we do have uh, sports documentaries. We have the Greg Louganis documentary that is uh, well watched on our platform. Um, so back on board, Greg, the Greg Lugana story is, is on our platform. Um, uh, not a sports documentary, but another well-watched documentary that I did not know about until COVID hit. And once I found out about it, I was like, Hey guys, team, we got to get this documentary. And it is called Upstairs Inferno. It was the largest, uh, mass murder of the LGBTQ community until, uh, the events that happened at Pulse in Orlando. Uh, so people were upstairs in a club and somebody came in downstairs and set the club on fire and people burned in that building. And then the community tried to sweep it under the rug and not advertise that it was gay people like the Pope didn't want to speak on it. And, you know, the Archbishop, I mean, it's crazy. It's a crazy story. Uh, but that's the most watched, um, uh, uh, documentary. Um, but back to the sports documentaries, we have Greg Luganis, we have Fallon Fox. Uh, Fallon Fox is a transgender woman, uh, boxer. Um, so we have her documentary as well. Um, so those, uh, the DC Divas, uh, that's about the uh, women's tackle football team uh, and, and how they went against the, the system uh, to fight for rights of LGBTQ community and sports. Uh, so that documentary is there as well. Uh, so uh, we we have we just added some animated uh, shorts uh, with our partnership with Frameline, uh, which is the oldest uh, film festival. Um, but uh, we have Love Your Cuz, which is a, a African American transgender uh, short film. I love that film. Oh my gosh, I love it. And then we have uh, My Aunties. And that is uh, a young gentleman uh, recounts animated uh, about the gentleman he grew up with during the AIDS epi epidemic, but he called them his aunties. Those were the people who helped raise him. But, you know, he also had to see them, you know, their demise uh, from the AIDS epidemic as well. So that's animated. So we have adult animation. We don't have children. So like Adult Swim on television is, is adult animation. Uh, so those are some of our top uh, uh, within the different genres that well we have done. on the platform. I just have a handful of minutes left with you. Sure. Uh, here's my last question for you. And it's simply this. When audiences come to SVTV and they enjoy some content from your network, what do you hope your audience comes away with after their, a visit or they've downloaded, they subscribe to, Strong Voices Television Network. What do you hope audiences come away with? This was a safe environment to watch content made for us, by us, and that represents us, that tell our lives, our stories, our way on one network, the SVTV Network. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, you know, I had, you know, excuse what's going on with Mr. Cosby, but uh, I had a different world, the show, a different world that was represented, you know, the first show that African-Americans went to college, a college show on television, uh, uh, the Cosby show. It was the first show, you know, that had a mom and a dad in the house and both was, one was a lawyer, one was a doctor and, and they were raising. So that was representation. Because I grew up, you know, with some good shows, but it was like Sanford and Son or the Jeffersons or Good Times. And and those are stories uh, of the African-American community. But it was not until, uh, you know, Fat Albert <laughs> with Mr. Cosby as well. Um, you know, that was the first animated storyline for the African-American community. So that was representation. So what we try and do with the network and what we want our subscribers to go away with when, when viewing our content, like, wow, they have a lot of representation, a lot of our stories, stories they're not going to see on mainstream media. I mean, you know, GLAD does a study every year and, you know, it's declining. Now, we do have some some movies out now. Bros is out. Uh, they did a, a reboot of a, a League of Their Own. Um, that tells some gay stories. So every now and again, we get little spurts in, in mainstream media and Hollywood. Pose 
kick down doors for, for the transgender community. Uh, so, but what happens after that? You know, pose is over now. So what, 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 what happens? So our platform, we're, we're 24 seven pride and representation 24 seven for the LGBTQ community. So that's what we want them to leave. Shari Johnson, I have to say, thank you so much for your time. Well said, well done, well made. I think you're a brilliant person. Not Thank just you, not just smart or educated, but brilliant. Well done. Thank you so much, Mark. It has been a pleasure and an honor. I, I thank you so much for the opportunity this evening to uh, uh, for you to allow us to amplify the voices of our community. And I appreciate everything that you do uh, with Rainbow Country, and uh, also what you do in amplifying our voices. Strong Voices Television, SVTV. Our lives, our stories, our way. Celebrating the LGBTQ community in television, film, sports, advocacy, and beyond. For more information, simply visit svtvnetwork.com. In the 60s, before the internet, to find each other, queer people needed to actually get together in real space and real time. Since most places didn't tolerate our kind, depending on where you were, your options could be limited. Large cities might have a few specialized commercial spaces, but in the absence of those, it was basically public washrooms, parks, or house parties. They all had their downsides. Commercial spaces required you to spend money, and that's one of the reasons why they were mostly for men. Even in places as big as Toronto, there was seldom more than one lesbian bar at a time. Lesbians earned about 60% of the male wage and probably had more dependents. The economy just wasn't there. The old adage was, gay men go to restaurants, lesbians hold potlucks. Washrooms and parks were also pretty much boys only and could be dangerous. Plus, parks in the Canadian winter, not so good. You could freeze your willy off. House parties, you needed to know somebody, or know somebody who knew somebody, and so on, and be invited. In terms of commercial life, Montreal had led the pack, developing a sin city reputation during Prohibition in the U.S. in the 1930s. And where there's sin, there's always a place for us. Toronto the Good and Vancouver took a bit longer, but in 1974, Toronto had enough anonymity and a critical mass to produce a small commercial scene. At first, it was mostly straight bars where we were tolerated in a corner as long as we behaved. Next came a few straight-owned venues that served gay clientele. By the mid-70s, a new class of gay entrepreneurs emerged and started to open up on Church Street where rents were cheaper. But not everybody lived in Toronto or Montreal. In smaller centers, where businesses couldn't meet community needs, the lesbian and gay liberation movement of the 70s came up with a new model. Defy economics and do it for ourselves. We might not have a lot of capital, but we did have free labor. For example, the Lesbian Organization of Toronto established a non-profit community centre in a ramshackle old Victorian house in 1977. It held dances and brunches and drop-ins and provided meeting spaces and a coffee house and hosted a phone line for a whole generation of women. Loot, as it was known, was following a strategy already developed elsewhere. In Saskatoon, the Zodiac Friendship Society opened its community centre in 1973. Edmonton and Calgary soon followed suit. HALO, the Homophile Association of London, Ontario, started in 1974, and the Halifax Gay Alliance for Equality first began running dances in the turret in 76, and later turned that into a community centre. By the end of the decade, there was a network of lesbian and gay groups providing community spaces in dozens of medium-sized centres across Canada, volunteer-run and community-controlled. This is Tim McCaskill, a gay liberation dinosaur from another planet and author of Queer Progress. Bill 7. To ban discrimination in employment, government services and housing based on a person's sexual orientation, was up for a vote at Queen's Park. Most NDP and Liberal MPPs supported the bill, but without some progressive conservative legislators' backing, 
a divisive split could rack the province. Four PCs decided to break party ranks to vote with their conscience and support Bill 7. Cabinet Minister and MPP Dennis Timbrell did it to show solidarity for his beloved brother, the well-known drag queen, Rusty Ryan. And for me, a gay politician who was not yet out, I had to take a stand. We were known as the Gang of Four. I'm former Cabinet Minister and MPP Phil Gillies. The date, December 2nd, 1986, when LGBT rights came to Ontario. And just like that, this little gay journey through Rainbow Country has come to an end. For the full two-hour episode, simply head over to marktara.com where everything is connected and hit the archives banner. To keep up to date with the show, check out my socials at marktara. The podcast is available on all major platforms. And finally, I want to take this time to thank you for taking your time to be with me. Remember, we are living in days of making dreams come true. So, believe in yourself. And the world will believe in you. I'm Billy Newton Davis, and we're sitting here on Rainbow Country with the fabulous Mark Tara.